It was in 1941. The snow fell very early in the autumn of that year. Then the rain came down. There was so much rain that there was water everywhere. And then the freeze came. The whole earth froze. The winter was very snowy. There was lots of snow everywhere. Our pit houses were so snowed under that we had to dig passages to get out. The spring was very warm. The temperature rose so that all the snow began to melt very quickly. More and more water appeared, flowing from all directions, so that in no more than a week we had a lake. However, there were no fishes to begin with. That's as much as I can tell you. Ozirnoye is a village inhabited by victims of the 1936 deportation and their descendants. Having brought them to Kazakhstan from areas that are today part of the Ukraine, areas formerly bordering with Poland, they were cast out here to cultivate the Kazakh steppes. They had no means of survival. The situation was very difficult, but more especially when hostilities began between Germany and the Soviet Union. There was great hunger. The snow began to thaw rapidly on March 25th, on the feast of Our Lady, the Mother of God, and from all the water a lake appeared. That, as can be seen from the water markings, was about seven kilometers long, by about three and a half to four wide. Fish appeared in that water in such large numbers that it not only saved the people of Ozornoye from famine, but also those in surrounding villages. From the start, the local people interpreted this as divine intervention. The mother of God's care, to whom they prayed for help, from the first moment of their banishment. In 1941. whom could we trust? In whom? Only in God. Ozyornoye, a small village on the steppes of northern Kazakhstan, 30 kilometers from the nearest asphalt road, is today, nearly 70 years after those events, regarded as a unique place to which Catholics from throughout Kazakhstan and Central Asia travel. In 1936, on Stalin's direct order, some 42,000 Poles were deported to Kazakhstan from the Ukraine, joining 38,000 Volga Germans who had previously been settled in Russia by Tsarina Catherine. Deportations continued up until 1941. Why? As an official NKVD document points out, persons were to be deported for reasons social or political, for coming from a chauvinistic nationalist or religious background, being in opposition to the socialist order. Most of the Poles that arrived from parts of today's Ukraine were farmers, later the wives and children of army officers or the intelligentsia. Why did Stalin decide to deport them to Kazakhstan and not elsewhere? In the first half of the 1930s, and as a result of the forcible collectivization of Kazakh nomads, over half of Kazakhstan's native population of six million people either perished from the typhus epidemic or hunger or fled the country. Kazakhstan lost its independence in 1936 and thus became one of the Soviet republics. Stalin's order condemning many to life in an area described as an inhuman land also led to the deportation of tens of thousands of Ukrainians, Belarusians, Chechens, English, as well as members of many other nationalities. My father was thrown into prison because his brother was studying to become a priest. He was locked away for three years. He visited us on a prison pass, which was when they began deporting us to Kazakhstan. We traveled in a goods train. We left everything behind, the newly completed home we had occupied for just three years. We left everything behind. We shared the goods carriage with cows.
When that day arrived, they took us to the railway station. The NKVD people were already there. They packed us into the train, allocating an armed guard to each carriage. And they brought us here to Kazakhstan. The journey was long, two weeks. We saw all sorts of towns on the way, good and bad, until they finally brought us to Tainsha. There was none of what they had promised. To add to all that, there was an eclipse of the sun, so it became dark and people were frightened that the end of the world was upon us. Then they transported us a further 25 kilometers and said, out. We asked, out where? Emptiness surrounded us. There was nothing. We fell to our knees and began to cry for our Ukraine. It happened at night, in the evening. It was very cold, a mighty frost, and we were told to unpack. So we unpacked then and there as we stood. They told us that they had brought us here because the land had to be cultivated. The steppes needed to be cultivated. But all this land was serving no useful purpose, and that is how they treated us, took us into exile. They said that we were at site 40. Father couldn't believe it. After all, there was nothing at site 40. Only a lake, some water, no barracks, nothing, no buildings. One of the women from our Ukrainian village was pregnant. Her husband dug a hole in the ground. I will cry. He dug this hole, covered it with earth and grass. And she bore two girls there. One of the girls died. And so she started a cemetery. More often than not, children died. Very many died. Three, four per family. Similarly with old people. After a heavy winter, people weren't used to it, and so they died. We were continually under guard. The village had a commandant who guarded us. We had to go and register and sign in daily to ensure that nobody had gone anywhere. We traveled from a village, so we took a cow and potatoes and flour, whatever we had. But those from towns had nothing. Life was somewhat lighter for us, whilst for those that had nothing, it was hard, very strenuous. The war began. Father died during the war, as did my brother, from the cold and the hunger, whilst we survived, grew up and went to work on the tractors. There was no school for young children, no education. We worked for two years until 1943, when they took us and attached us to a labor force. We became exhausted, unloading train carriages, opening up mines. Not everybody survived. 
We told the head man to send us to the front line, to which he would say, if life is too hard for you, why not lay your head on the rail track, under the wheels? We wanted to die, but God had given us life to that day. We had to serve God. We walked and we begged, God, please bring people to reason. When the war ended, they gave us bread. We had our fill, came back to, and things became a little easier. If you look at a map of Kazakhstan, you will begin to understand why Kazakhstan was regarded as one of the worst places in the USSR. People were deported here in the hope that they would not survive. Stalin decided to destroy, to destroy people by means of climate and nature, and many died. Some on their way there, whilst others on the steps. But then they were brought to the steps and told to do as they pleased, but without any means of survival. Some were allowed to bring from 25 to 40 kilograms of belongings. Deportees survived uniquely thanks to the help of the Kazakh people. That is why they are grateful to the Kazakhs to this day for their hospitality, for the way they were received. Not everyone was deported to set up collective farms. Some ended up in labor camps, scattered throughout the Soviet Union. One of the largest labor camps, third in size among the 96 camps of the USSR, was Karlag, situated in central Kazakhstan, around the city of Karaganda. The camp stretched 300 kilometers north to south and 200 kilometers east to west. It is estimated that one and a half million people passed through the camp between 1931 and 1959. Prisoners worked 18 hours a day, predominantly in the local coal mines, accommodated in barracks, each housed from 70 to 100 inmates. The actual number of people who lost their lives remains unknown to this day. Based on partly declassified data, nearly 12,000 people died in the camp only in 1943. Just outside Astana, Kazakhstan's current capital city, stood Malinovka, the Soviet Union's biggest forced labor camp for women. 